Hello, everyone. We're going to get started with today's webinar on whales. We're really excited to be back with you. And uh, if you haven't joined us yet, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who OPAC is. Um, we are a nonprofit that travels mostly around uh, New England teaching K through 12 marine science classes. We do this a little bit differently than other organizations. Uh, we like to teach through art and advocacy workshops. Um, so all of our ocean activities always have an art component, which we're going to get to at the end of this webinar. We have some follow-up resources for you to do at home. Uh, so that's just our mission statement there. And you can find out more about our year-round workshops at our website, um, www.opakedu.org. Uh, today's workshop is going to be all about marine megafauna, uh, specifically our whales. So we're going to learn about what a marine mammal is. We're going to explore some of the differences between toothed and baleen whales. We're going to talk about some specific species like humpbacks and sperm whales. Uh, we're going to identify some threats to whales in the ocean. And we're also going to learn what we can do to protect these wonderful species. And then I am going to talk about some activities that you can do at home to keep learning about whales. And then we are going to have a Q&A at the end of this broadcast. So I will ask that you only use the chat function for ocean related questions and comments. And I will get to all of the questions at the end of the webinar. Um, if you have to leave early for some reason and you did have a question, please uh, shoot us an email or post uh, the question to our Facebook page. If you haven't liked our Facebook page, uh, please do so. That is where we um, will be continuing to update our virtual learning experiences. All right. So what do we mean by marine megafauna? And if you joined us for our pinniped workshop, um, this will look familiar, but we're referring to the, the very large creatures in our oceans. So these are our seals, our whales, our sharks, the big fish, which we're gonna talk about on Thursday. So if you haven't registered for that webinar, please do so. These are also our turtles and manatees, giant squid, giant manta rays. So it's all the really big creatures in our ocean. Um, but when we're talking about marine mammals, there are things that um, all of our marine mammals share. Um, all marine mammals are warm blooded. They need to breathe air. So when we're talking about our whales today, remember that they don't live underwater. Uh, they need to come up to the surface to breathe. Uh, all marine mammals have hair or fur during at least some part of their development. And they all bear live young. And they all, uh, all females produce milk for their young as well. So those are what the characteristics of, that all of our marine mammals share. And uh, it's important to remember that not all marine megafauna are marine mammals. So turtles, fish, et cetera, they're not marine mammals. Uh, so we have three groups of marine mammals. Uh, we talked about our pinnipeds in the carnivoria order uh, last week, and we're gonna talk about our cetacea today, so our whales, and we have the tooth whales and our baleen whales, the mysticeti there, the mustache whale, uh, and we're going to talk about quite a few of the species here. We are not going to be talking about um, dolphins or porpoises today, though, even though those still are in the family of cetaceans. We are just going to focus on our whales, and we have some whales that have teeth and some that have baleen, like I mentioned. Um, so our baleen whales are usually the, the much larger whales, um, like our blue whales and our humpback whales. They often um, live by themselves. They make really long annual migrations and they feed on aggregations of plankton and small fish. So they don't go after individuals and they use sound to communicate with each other. And our tooth whales are usually a lot smaller. Uh, they're more social with each other. Uh, most are not migratory, um, so they're not going from place to place. They are chasing individual fish or squid or crustaceans like a crab down on the ocean floor instead of uh, big aggregations of plankton or krill. And they use sound not just to communicate, but to echolocate, so to navigate um, and to find their food when they're in the deep, dark depths of our ocean. So. Uh, pretty obvious that our tooth whales are using their teeth to eat, but uh, how do baleen whales eat and what is baleen? So baleen is made of keratin, which is um, 
similar, it has the same proteins that um, our fingernails and hair do. Um, and baleen was uh, really popular in the whaling days to be caught for uh, females' corsets, as well as um, buggy whips. There's some other uses for them as well. But basically baleen acts like a comb for whales that they can uh, take all of the plankton out of the ocean and suck up their food. And there are a few different uh, feeding styles that baleen whales use to eat. Uh, and we're gonna see an example of all of these in the species that we're looking at. So we have our skimmers. These are our baleen whales that uh, swim pretty slowly with their mouths open a lot of the time, eating a lot of the smaller uh, plankton that are out there, like our right, and our right whale would be an example of this. And we have our gulpers uh, and these skim, but a lot faster and they're taking bigger gulps of water, sometimes as much as their own body. And uh, so each time they take a big gulp of water, uh, they're gonna forcefully expel all of that water as well. So our skimmers are coming across the top nice and slow. Our gulpers, think of humpback whales. Um, and our other rope coral whales, um, they are taking bigger gulps of water. And then we have our bottom feeders. Uh, an example of this would be the gray whale. And they uh, suck up sediment and filter out food at the bottom of the ocean. So they're rubbing their mouths across the bottom to get uh, crustaceans and bottom fish. All right, so we're gonna spend some time just talking about some different whales now. Uh, we're gonna start with the humpback whale because you can see our logo there in the bottom right corner. Uh, we love the humpback whale at OPEC. It's a really vocal whale. Um, it's one of the most energetic of the large whales, and it also makes one of the most complex sounds in the animal kingdom, which I just want to start with. hear that song, um, just so you know, in case you have to leave, uh, we have linked a the Watkins Marine Mammal Sound Database at our resource page, which is where we found all of the sound clips that we're going to share with you today. Um, but again, the humpback whale has one of the longest and most complex sounds out there. The adults are rather large, um, 40 to 50 feet long, and they can weigh up to 40 tons. Um, their pectoral flippers, which if you're looking at the picture are in the middle of their body there, those can be about a third of the length of the whale's body. So they're very wide. <laughs> and what we had there was just a little example of the feeding technique of the humpback whale. And these are very common to be bubble feeders, especially in the Pacific. And by bubble feeding, uh, it's the type of the gulping feeding where the humpback whales will expel um, air bubbles and chase larger aggregations of fish and plankton into a herd. And then the, the whales will be able to eat them uh, in a rhythmic pattern usually. Um, there's some wonderful videos of bubble feeding out there. Um, and that was an example of a humpback whale gulp feeding in Stellwag Bank. Uh, the humpback whale can eat up to 3,000 pounds of food in a day. Just to put that into perspective for you of weight, a Toyota Corolla weighs about 2,800 pounds. So they're eating about a Corolla worth of food every day. Humpback whales are really unique because they're easy to identify. Uh, all of their tails have their own fingerprints. Um, so that fluke there, this is the whale salt um, and I've linked salt's um, lineage on our website for you. Salt's one of the most studied whales in Stellwagen Bank here in Massachusetts. Um, there also are quite a few other whales that come here every year and I've linked those on our website as well. Not only are the humpback whales uh, energetic singers, uh, they Ha they make really long annual migrations and they show a lot of different breaching displays uh, like bobtailing and they can actually jump all the way out of the water and breach. Um, 
these migrations that I just mentioned, they can be up to 3,000 miles in the Pacific, so going from Hawaii up to Alaska. Um, and they can do that in about 36 days. So they're moving pretty quickly when they do that migration. We do find humpback whales all over the world. Um, the population that I've been most accustomed to is where number one is on the screen here. And those are the humpbacks coming from the Caribbean up to Massachusetts and Canada. But you do see that there are humpback whales all over the world. Uh, the next whale I'm going to talk about is the North Atlantic right whale. This is a highly endangered whale. There are only about 400 of them left in the world. Uh, they're right here in the backyard of OPAC's headquarters in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, they became an endangered species in 1970, even though they've been hunted long before that. And they were hunted because they were the, the right whale to hunt. They're slow swimmers and they skim at the top of the water. They're also very buoyant, so when they were hunted and killed, uh, they would float at the surface. Um, and they're really big whales, so they were getting um, a lot of monetary or economic benefit from hunting these whales. These can be up to around 60 feet long and weigh up to 70 tons, so they're almost twice the weight of our humpback whale there that we just saw. Uh, these guys are eating primarily copepods and smaller zooplankton. They have about 200 to 270 pairs of baleen on their upper jaw on each side. Uh, so they have a lot of really long, fine baleen. Those baleen plates can be up to, I believe it's eight feet. Um, they're really big um, and they can be uh, identified by cholecystites on their uh, head. And these are around their blowholes and their jaw. And um, the Clostocytes are made up of something called a stymid, which is like whale lice. And they have little colonies, and these colonies are unique to each whale, and they don't change over the lifetime of the whale. So this is a way that we can identify different whales, and it's how we can uh, see new whales that are coming every year to our region here. It's also how we can tr keep track of um, mating and migrations. And uh, humpback whale, or sorry, North Atlantic right whales can also be identified by a unique V um, shaped spout, and they don't have a dorsal fin. So if we just saw them um, out on the horizon and we didn't see a dorsal fin, we would be going in the right direction of being able to ID our whale. I want to make sure I've got all my notes here for you. There are um, Southern Atlantic right whales as well that are not as endangered. They're uh, doing much better. And another unique fact, the North Atlantic right whale's head is about a third of the size of its body. So they have very large heads. And there's still a lot of mystery about this species. Um, they kind of disappear in the late fall and we're not sure what they're doing. Um, but they do make migrations as well. They are our large baleen whales. They do travel down to the southeastern part of the United States in the winter months to um, have their babies. And then they come back up here to New England where they uh, spend a lot of time in Cape Cod Bay and then move up towards Maine and Canada in the spring and summer. Uh, so this is just showing you what I just mentioned. Um, we have our calving grounds for our North Atlantic right whales on the southeastern part of the United States, and then they are coming up to our New England and Canadian waters in the summer and fall. All right, the next whale we're going to talk about is the fin whale. This is the second largest whale in the world. Um, they can reach lengths of up to 85 feet and weigh about 80 tons. They do have a very streamlined, long body. They're also endangered because of overhunting. Um, and they are named for the hooked dorsal fin that they have near their tails, which you can see in the picture faintly here on the left. Um, point that out for you. I don't think you can see my mouse. Um, the dorsal fin is back here. Um, 
And um, sorry, sorry, my Zoom here here. Sorry, I lost control of my mouse. One moment. My apologies. Uh, so that was their, their dorsal fin again near the, their tail. Uh, fin wheels, uh, all right. We're able to identify them because of the, the strange color patterns that they have near their heads. Uh, they have these wonderful ventral plates and on their, their lower jaw, they have much different color patterns than on their upper jaw. And so we can use photo ID of their color patterns and, the, and some scars that they will have there from entanglements to ID these whales. They're also some of the fastest whales in the ocean. They can, for our um, baleen whales, they can swim up to 23 miles an hour. So they move quite fast. They are gulp feeders um, and they're able to do this because of the wonderful, uh, sorry, the plates that they have. Um, if you're looking at the, the picture here, these are rope roll whales, just like our humpback, um, and they use the plates as um, basically an accordion, so they can open them up really wide and take in massive amounts of water. Our fin whale can actually engulf the mass of um, a school bus in about 35 feet, which for them, they can get about 25 pounds of krill from. So they move really quick and they take in large amounts of water. Uh, little is actually known about the fin whales mating systems, um, but we think just like other baleen whales that they don't form long-term bonds with each other. Uh, fin whales do have very flat heads and um, they have actually been known to breed with blue whales uh, out in the open ocean, um, but we haven't seen the offspring of that hybrid actually be able to reproduce. And uh, we do find fin whales in the same area that we do find um, other whales here in the North Atlantic, like our humpbacks and right whales. And we do find fin whales in most parts of our ocean, except in the Arctic, which you can see here um, by the blues. And there are three subspecies um, that we find by geography. Uh, the species that are in the North Atlantic and North Pacific um, are usually considered subspecies within themselves because they don't um, breed together. Uh, so the fin whale is the second largest whale in the ocean. We have the blue whale, which is the largest animal to ever live on our planet. Uh, and they're also some of the longest living. Uh, the oldest recorded blue whale was about 110 years old. These whales can get to be 100 to 110 feet long and weigh up to around 170 tons. Uh, we do find though that the larger of these whales, so the ones that are at the max lengths and max weights are in um, the Antarctic waters. So our southern blue whales are larger than our northern blue whales that we find here in the North Atlantic, North Pacific. Uh, believe it or not, their tongue can weigh as much as an elephant and their heart as much as a car. Um, so they are, these are really large animals and they can eat up to about four tons of krill in a day during their peak feeding times. Uh, they get their name from the molted blue gray color that they appear to be in underwater, um, that's their name. They have one of the, the loudest calls on the planet. Uh, they're, song can travel about a thousand miles underwater. Uh, so we've, we've actually heard w blue whale sounds off the east coast that are coming from around uh, Ireland and Britain. So they travel quite far. Uh, and if you were to be near this blue whale when it was putting out this call, the cry can be louder than a jet engine. And it's thought that the sound might not just be used for communication um, because the blue whales do make deep dives, especially in Antarctica for their food. 
where there isn't a lot of light. Um, and a fun fact about the blue whale, they can blow water out of their blowhole up to about 30 feet high when they exhale. Uh, they are really amazing whales, but they were hunted as well. There are about 360,000 blue whales that were killed um, in the first half of the 20th century before their population was um, put in moratorium for whaling or whale hunting in about uh, mid 60s, 1960s. Uh, we do find blue whales in all the same places that we find fin whales, so everywhere but the Arctic. Uh, so the next whale I want to talk about is the gray whale. It's also been called the devil fish because they are incredibly intelligent. And in the whaling days, um, when they were being speared, uh, harpooned, the, they would be really aggressive towards those boats. Uh, times when uh, there were reports of the gray whale actually trying to attack the whaling boats. Um, but over time, they've learned that they are not being hunted. And there are places um, in Baja where they come right up to boats um, are extremely friendly and curious. They are uh, about the same size range as our humpback whale. So in the 40 foot range and about 45 tons. They do make one of the longest migrations of any of our marine mammals, about 12,000 miles from Baja, Mexico, up to Alaska. Uh, so around 12,000 miles round trip. They are benthic feeders. So these are the types of whales that are doing the vacuum feeding. So they're swimming along the bottom, they're sucking up uh, our benthic creatures like amphipods, which are small crustaceans. And this does leave a nice cloud of benthic mud behind them, which uh, is a good food resource for other animals that live near the gray whale. Uh, gray whales also do not have a dorsal fin. They have a dorsal hump, as well as um, some knuckles that can be used to identify them near their tail. Uh, there are two populations of gray whales. There are the gray whales on the western coast of the United States. And then there's also um, a population in the western Pacific near China that is endangered right now. The population near the United States is doing much better, uh, even though these whales were hunted just like all of our whales during the whaling time. Uh, so the next whale we're going to talk about is the bowhead whale, which has some of the longest baleen on the planet. Uh, this whale gets its name from its extremely large uh, bow-shaped skull, and they use this um, skull to break through ice, because this uh, species is living up in the Arctic. Uh, no, thought that they can break through about eight inch thick sea ice, but there are reports from natives in the area that I've seen them breaking through ice up to two feet thick, uh, which will leave a lot of scarring patterns on their head, which we can use to identify the whale. This whale, like I mentioned, has the longest baleen. It can be up to about 14 feet long of all of our whales. And some of the, the thickest blubber out there as well, it can have blubber um, about two feet thick. Uh, these whales, are a little bit longer than some of the whales that we've talked about. They're about 60 to 65 feet long, and they can weigh up to about 100 tons. Uh, because they are living in dark, icy water, sound is really critical for bowhead survival. They rely on it for navigation, uh, foraging of food, um, presence of predators, and uh, communication with each other. Uh, it's also believed that the bowhead whale is one of the longest living whales out there. They can live up to 200 years old by some reports of some DNA sequencing, um, but it's been thought for a while that they can live up to well over 100 years old. Um, and we've known this because of recovered harpoon tips um, and just backdating when those were in fashion. Uh, do you wanna play a little clip of the bowhead sound, uh, which again is very critical for its survival. <laughs> um, you can 
can again find these uh, clips of their songs on the Watkins Marine Mammal Sound Database, which is provided by Huey and the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Uh, you can hear that the bowhead whale's call is much different than the humpbacks. So we can also use uh, sound to identify different whale species. Bowhead whales will eat about 220,000 pounds of crustaceans and krill in a year. Uh, so they do eat a lot. They're foraging all the time. Um, and they are happy with krill and other small fish. Uh, our bowhead whales, again, are living in the Arctic or the northern part of our planet in cold, icy waters. All right, so those were our baleen whales. We're going to talk about a few of our tooth whales now. And we're going to start with the largest tooth whale, the sperm whale. Uh, sperm whales are named after spermaceti, which is a waxy substance that was well sought after during the whaling period uh, for oil lamps and candles. And this is found in an organ in their head. Uh, sperm whales also have the largest brain in the animal kingdom. They can grow to about 50 feet long and weigh about 45 tons or 90,000 pounds. Uh, they are obviously recognized by their uh, shape of their head and their lower jaw, which can have up to 52 cone-shaped teeth that weigh about a kilo each. Um, they do have that very square head, which does make them easy to identify. Our sperm whales do prefer deeper waters, so we don't really find them in coastal areas. And they spend much, much of their time dive into deep depths for their food, um, dive about three kilometers down, and they can hold their breath for up to two hours, even though they only usually dive for about 45 minutes. Um, and because they're diving so deep, they do rely on echolocation to find their food and uh, their hunting process. If you have joined us uh, in the past, you remember that once we go below 1,000 meters, below the sea floor, or below the uh, surface of the ocean, uh, we do not have light anymore. So for the sperm whale to be able to find its food, uh, which includes giant squid and other smaller squids and octopus, uh, they need to echolocate. Uh, one way that we can identify sperm whales are by scars, um, which they often get from fights with giant squid. Um, even though the sperm whale usually is going to win that battle, uh, the squid does fight back. Uh, our sperm whales, again, um, prefer deeper waters, so we don't really find them in our coastal areas unless there are deep trenches, and they are found in most of our oceans around the world. Uh, next, we have the, the narwhal which are much smaller than the whales that we've talked about so far. They're only about 13 to 20 feet long, and they're uh, only about a ton and a half, so they're about the size of our Corolla in weight. Uh, they are well known because of their tusk, which is actually a elongated canine tooth, uh, which can be about a third of their body length. These tusks always rotate counterclockwise or to the left, um, if you're looking from the tusk. Uh, most males do have these tusks, even though not all do, and some actually have two. Um, and if they do have two, the left one is usually longer than the right one. And uh, about only about 15% of females have this tusk. Uh, it, there's been a lot of hypotheses of what this tusk was used for, um, whether it's for spearfishing, uh, drilling holes through the ice so that they can breathe. Um, but most likely they're just used um, like deer antlers to show off to mates. Um, so to, to spar with each other and to fight. Uh, and most males that we see, especially the older males, do have quite a bit of scarring around their head from these battles with each other. Um, before the 17th century, narwhals were actually believed to be uh, the horn of the unicorn. Uh, so there's a lot of 
folklore about the narwhal and unicorn tusks, which is pretty obvious just by looking at them. Uh, these whales still are hunted by native tribes in Canada and Greenland uh, for the tusks and for their meat. Uh, narwhals uh, also have backward facing flukes, which is similar to beluga whales as well, uh, which is one way that we can ID them. And uh, their main predator are us humans, uh, which I mentioned are still hunted by natives, but uh, they can also be hunted by polar bears and killer whales when they are trapped in the ice. And uh, I thought it'd be fun just to mention that the narwhal is one of the deepest diving whales out there. Uh, the deepest dive that has been recorded that I could find was about 1800 meters. Um, and these dives are usually in the winter months when they're doing their very deep dives uh, to find food because they're more trapped in the ice. Um, just to put that in the perspective, a one mile narwhal dive is the same as diving or same as swimming to the bottom of a deep end of a swimming pool 400 times without taking a breath. So these creatures really do need to be able to adapt to slowing their heartbeats and things to be able to dive that deep. And the, the pressure at depths of over 800 meters in our ocean would be like giving a piggyback ride to 22 of your 100 pound friends at the same time. So think about all of that weight being put down on you, which is why as humans, we need uh, to be going down in submarines and pressurized submersibles to be able to go to those depths. Um, and like I mentioned, these deep dives are usually in the winter and they're for bottom fish like halibut. Um, however, the narwhal also does eat squid and other fish and is usually only diving to depths about, about 300 meters in the summer months. Uh, narwhals do spend most of their time underwater. And we find narwhals in our Arctic regions. Uh, so in the ice, in cold, water, uh, along with their friends, the, the beluga whales. Uh, belugas are extremely sociable whales, just like most of their toothed whale friends. They do live and hunt together in pods uh, that range from a few individuals up to a few hundred whales. Um, and I saw some reports that when they're migrating, it can be even in the thousands of whales. Uh, they're the same size as our narwhals, about 13 to 20 feet long and about a ton and a half in weight. Uh, like sperm whales, uh, we have the bulbous forehead, it's called a melon. Um, beluga whales can change the shape of that, which allows them to make different facial expressions um, and uh, quite a few different songs. And because they're so vocal and sociable, I thought it would be fun just to see a short video of the different noises that they can make. Um, and we, I'm going to show that here. The songs that they're showing are probably used to communicate with each other and to find food through echolocation, like their toothed whale relatives. Hi, everyone. My name is Carrie, and I'm a beluga whale trainer here at Mystic Aquarium. And today, we're going to talk about beluga whale vocalizations. Right, Keela? <laughs> Beluga whales can make a wide range of vocalizations, all the way from high-pitched sounds down to low-pitched sounds. They can make them at different frequencies as well. And because of this, they've earned the nickname the Canary of the Sea. Check this out. will use their vocalizations to communicate with one another. They can also use a high-pitched clicking sound for echolocation, and this allows them to see in dark, deep, murky waters when they're hunting or looking for breathing holes. This is what that high-pitched click would sound like at a much higher frequency that human ears can't even hear. <laughs> ah! 
Now those clicks will bounce off of objects in the animal's environment and return to them in the form of an echo. This is processed by their brain and they're able to identify what's in front of them without using their eyes at all. Beluga whales do not have any vocal cords, so all of the sounds that they make come from the blowhole on the tops of their heads. They have two air sacs in there that they can manipulate the shape of, blowing them up or shrinking them down, thus making the different pitches. Thanks so much for joining us today to learn about beluga whale vocalizations. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos like this. <laughs> All right, uh, so that video was from Mystic Aquarium. As you can see in the notes there, um, unfortunately, because they're so, uh, beluga whales are so social and they make such wonderful songs, uh, one of their biggest predators are us humans, so you will often find beluga whales in aquariums. Um, most of the beluga whales that I've seen that are captive um, are being rehabilitated. Oftentimes, once they are in an aquarium, they cannot be returned to the wild. Um, but again, the, they are, we are one of their biggest predators. Uh, beluga whales eat similar things to our narwhal. They're living in similar habitats, uh, so larger fish and bottom fish, as well as crustaceans like crabs. Uh, and another fun fact about our beluga whale, uh, they do not have fused vertebrae in their neck, so they can turn their head in all directions, unlike most whales. And uh, we do find our beluga whales, again, in the, the Arctic region, so north of Russia and Greenland and Canada and near Alaska. So those were some examples of our toothed and baleen whales. Um, and all whales do have quite a few threats um, to their survival. For quite a long time, whaling of all species was very active. Um, it is still active in Japan, Norway, and Iceland. Uh, and there's still about 1,500 of our large whales killed every year for whaling, as well as um, that many thousands of uh, smaller cetaceans like dolphins and porpoise. Uh, whaling was banned for profit in the 1960s. Um, so, sorry, some of the moratoriums were put in in the 1960s, and then it was uh, banned in 1980 to from our whaling commission. Uh, there's a lot about the history of whaling uh, linked on our resource page. Uh, different species had different histories of when uh, restrictions were put in place as well as when different countries started to recognize these uh, restrictions. Uh, but in America, the peak of the whaling trade was in the, the mid 1800s. And the picture here is an example of what a whaling vessel would have looked like. This is the Charles W. Morgan, which is the, the last wooden whale ship uh, left. It is at Mystic Seaport in Connecticut. Uh, and the whaling trade was quite dangerous for people involved, uh, both economically and physically. And like I did say, it still is active in Japan, Norway, and Iceland. Um, so there are some ways that you can get involved in protecting whales by trying to, to ban the whaling in those countries. Uh, a large threat to whales is fishing gear. Uh, so think of moorings and traps and pots. Um, in Cape Cod Bay, one of the large things that we have is lobster gear, which gets entangled in our humpback whales and our right whales. And if the whale itself doesn't get stuck, it ends up dragging that gear for a long time period of time and it uh, fatigues the whale, slows down the whale, and can eventually kill the whale. Uh, shipping traffic is a big threat for whales. So if you are a recreational boater, we want to make sure that we're adhering to whale watching guidelines because recreational traffic um, is one way that whales get harassed. Uh, we, we don't want to be getting too close to whales, uh, not just because of the possibility of our ship strike, um, but noise pollution is a, a large issue for whales. As we've seen, they all communicate, whether 
It's for mating or food, uh, echolocation, navigation, etc. cetera. Um, shipping traffic is a, a big source of noise pollution as well as sonar from naval vessels and shipping vessels, as well as sonic blasting uh, to map the bottom of the sea floor and to find uh, oil reserves on the ocean floor. Uh, plastic pollution is a huge issue for whales, uh, oh, especially for our baleen whales that are filter feeding. Uh, so it's not just the large pieces of plastic that are gonna be impacting our whales, it's the smaller pieces of plastic. So our whales are filtering the, the plankton as well as the plastic, and this will get caught in their gut and not be digestible, uh, which in the long term can kill them. And then we also have things like oil and other contaminants that can impact whales when they come up to breathe. Those pollutants can get caught in their lungs, which can um, harm them in the long term as well. Uh, we can learn a little bit more about all these threats in detail through resources like NOAA, um, but it is important to remember that even though these whales are large and they seem like they're far away from us out in the ocean, there are many ways that we are impacting them. Uh, if you are looking for some things to do at home right now, there are quite a few uh, wonderful books about whales, uh, fictional and nonfiction. Uh, so here's just a, a small list of some of my favorites. Uh, obviously there, there's Moby Dick, In the Heart of the Sea, which was inspired by uh, Herman Melville, uh, War of the Worlds, what's that? War of the Whales, uh, which is about noise pollution in the ocean, and then the, the whale in search of the giants, which is a little bit more factual. Uh, what can you do to help whales from your own home? Uh, or when you're out on the water, you want to make sure, again, we're keeping our distance. We want to report marine life in distress so that we can help entangled whales. Uh, we want to reduce our speed on the water and keep a lookout. Uh, we want to report any violations that we see. And on our resources page on our website, uh, you joined us for part one of our marine megafauna series. We do have the resources there for, that you can report violations that you see, as well as find uh, regulations for marine megafauna in your region. Uh, I always like to say, what can you do to keep helping whales? Uh, you can keep learning. It all starts with knowing. If we don't understand these animals, how can we help them? Uh, in that same sense, we can be the voice the ocean needs because the ocean can't speak for itself. Uh, and at OPAC, we like to do that through artwork. So there's a few different activities that we put together for you. Uh, the first is writing your own whale story or song. So we do this workshop called Songs of the Sea where we analyze different whale acoustics. Um, and then we usually write our own rap song in the classroom. So we've put together a prompt for you to be able to do that at home, which you can find on our website. So you can either write your own whale story or a whale song. Please share those with us when you're done. And then as you can see on the bottom of the screen here, um, we have make your own whale tale. So we did learn that humpback whales are unique and that their flukes are all different, like their own fingerprints. So we often have students make their own whale tail that shows us who they are. So they put your own fingerprint on the whale tail. And again, we have that activity on our website for you. Uh, you can either do it right on the paper or you can cut out the whale tail and uh, do it as a painting like we have on the bottom of the screen here or however, or whatever medium you'd like to do it in. Uh, you can also submit your whale artwork to quite a few art contests that are out there right now, um, like the Massachusetts Marine Educators or Bow Seed Awareness. And then, as I mentioned, through some of the slides, uh, we have quite a few resources on our website right now um, about lineages of uh, different whales, uh, whale sounds, as well as some research that's going on uh, right now in the field. And I have also linked the, the video that I showed you to our website. So I'm gonna take a little bit of time for any questions that you may have, and then we'll be wrapping it up.
want to put questions in either the chat or the Q&A function. We have another minute or so just for some questions to come in here. Uh, what is the most endangered whale? I would say all of them, but specifically in our area is North Atlantic right whale. As I mentioned, there are only about 400 left in the world. And I see another question, why did they kill the North Atlantic white whale so much? Um, it was Again, like for other whales, uh, for their, their baleen, and their oil and their blubber, uh, but they were just one of the easier whales to get at because they are skimming at the water. They're also rather large. So you were getting a lot of resources from one whale. What is the smallest whale? Um, so our tooth whales are gonna be much smaller than our baleen whales. Uh, and there are beaked whales, um, which are very similar to our dolphins or porpoise. Um, so those are gonna be some of our smaller whales out there. Can't tell you the exact species that is the smallest though. Uh, what is the narwhal's unicorn-like thing made out of? Um, so the unicorn thing, like the unicorn-like thing, is a, a tusk that is the canine tooth of the narwhal. So think of like um, dog teeth. All right, um, just so you do know, we have one more part of our marine megafauna series. We're gonna move away from marine mammals and talk about our fish on Thursday. Um, so think of marlin and swordfish. Um, we will be taking a break next week for April vacation, um, but we now have quite a few of our webinars posted on our YouTube channel as well as our website. So if you've missed any and you wanna join in, uh, you're more than welcome to view those there. And we have a wonderful resource page on our website. Uh, we wanna take a little bit of time to thank all of our supporters um, without whom we would not be able to offer these webinars or workshops during the school year and summer months. If you wanna learn more about uh, OPAC, there is a link to our website. And we wanna just say thank you again uh, for joining us.